Imagine what it would be like if every leader in your organization was optimized. Welcome to Fortify Live with your host, Ford Sakes. Welcome to Fortify Live. Our guest today is Mary Kelly. She's been a commander in the US Navy. She's a certified speaking professional and a CPAE, which is a Hall of Fame. I'm also in the Hall of Fame and I've been trying to get her on Fortify Live for a long time, but she's so busy helping organizations lead more effectively, but we've got her here today. And we were talking in the green room about leadership and some of the things that she's working on. And for those of you listening, you know, we're live right now on Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube and a few other places. And, you know, I always talk about AI in every episode now because it's affecting every area of business. But Mary, you were talking about AI as it related to leadership. So first, welcome to the show. And what were you talking about with this AI? Ford, you are the techno wizard when it comes time to things like AI. You're the one who taught me the most probably about AI when it all sort of blew up and everybody got very excited about it. And I'm very grateful for that. I look at AI like like your normal C-suite leader does. I don't know the technical nuances. I'm not sure how to make it all work, but I know it is the future of my organization. I know I have to embrace it. I know I have to get ahead of it. I know that right now everybody is talking about it. Everybody says they're using it, but most people are not optimizing it. So what we are doing right now is taking a look at AI as a strategy for leaders. And it's not just, oh, maybe you should incorporate this to make your, your hiring process a little bit easier by writing that job description by using AI. No, it is a full comprehensive AI strategy playbook for leaders that allows them to get finally ahead of the wave. Now you, you had some interesting statistics, you know, how many people are using it. And before you share your statistics, what I've found in the research I've done is every time I do a keynote, I'm actually, you know, speaking in a franchise group this weekend on unleashing AI, everything you need to know now. And of course that was booked, you know, six months ago. Well, things have changed every month, every week, every day. So I'll be preparing those final presentation notes the night before the presentation. But what's interesting is I always ask my audience on a scale of one to 10, how well are you using it? And I say, keep your hand up as I raise the number. One, you're a beginner and 10, you're a rock star. And usually the hands start going down around five, six, but usually there's some people keep their hand up all the way to 10. And then I, I do my presentation for about the first 15 minutes. And then I say, well, let's check in with the audience. And their hands all go back to a one because they're delusional about the, the, implica the implications. They're delusional about how well they're using it. And they're Teams are already using it now. So you had some statistics. What were the statistics stats you had? So right now, Ford, we know that in organizations across the United States, 86% of your people are using some form of AI to help them do their jobs better. Now, before people get too excited about that, they're not using it in the best possible way. They're using it for, I know, they're using it for memes on social media, they're using it to help them write job descriptions, they're helping themselves to write marketing and emails. Okay, those are the easy ones, but here's where people say they're concerned that their people are using AI. Product descriptions, product advertising, and then here's where I think it gets a little dumb, uh, what books you should read, what TV shows you should watch, and what music you should listen to. Okay. I'm not sure how that's terribly relevant to your competitive advantage unless you're in the entertainment industry, but that's where people are spending their time. They're not doing high level things. We're not replacing anybody with robots yet. We just don't have that technology yet. So what I'm asking my leaders right now is, are you aware of the usage going on in your organization? Because right now, 13% of everything on chat can technically be classified as confidential or privacy sensitive data. And I'm talking patient records, patient communication, certain high level negotiation things that you probably do not want the rest of the world to know about. And yet there is precious little guidance on how to do this well. Meanwhile, your employees are all worried that you're gonna come in and say, oh, you're not allowed to use uh, AI for anything, which will cause them to go to another organization. Well, you know, it's interesting because I've seen that happen in the organizations. There's two, there's two schools of thought. One is they're embracing AI and they're not setting up the best practices, which every organization, everybody watching, whether you're an employee or C-level executive or an owner, 
you need to have best practices. And obviously, you know, separate from this episode on Fortify Live, I have training. You can go to YouTube. You can go to ProfitRichResults.com forward slash AI dash training. So it's really easy. If you're listening to this as the podcast, because this episode also is live as video, but it also is the business growth show podcast. It's ProfitRichResults.com forward slash AI dash training. And that's where I keep an updated hour training that's free that I give away to people to learn how to leverage it. But back to the point of what you're saying, there's two schools of thought. They're either using it or they're not using it and they're fearful and they're delusional about what it can and can't do. I mean, I, I can't believe that every time I present, people say, well, this is, it, it won't do this. It will do this. They don't know what they don't know. And that's really scary. The other yes. thing is talking about your ethics and confidentiality and how, what leaders need to know is this, what I like, and especially with this episode with you is you're really known for leadership, your identity. When I think of who's a leader, it's you. I've been in masterminds with you. You and I are both in the million dollar uh, speakers club together for the national speakers association. And I love networking with you because you just have a, a no <laughs> BS approach to getting things done. And I just like your strategic thinking. I mean, that's what made you a commander. That's what made you successful in business and in the hall of fame. And what I like is that you're taking your expertise in strategic thinking and applying it to one of their biggest challenges coming forward, which is the impact that AI is going to have on their organization because leaders are using it, staff are using it, their families are using it, and most likely they're using it incorrectly. And so that's a long road here to a tiny little house. But I think what's really important to, to think about is what are the five things that you need to convey to all of your organizations other than the fact that AI will hallucinate, it will make things up, it will, it's biased as we know from what happened with Google's Gemini, if you've watched that in the news, and it'll just, it'll just completely make things up. And I always tell my audiences to treat AI as an intern that you have to train and monitor as opposed to an expert that's going to replace you. That's exactly right. And you need to talk to it like it's an intern. And that means giving it feedback as well. Hey, these points that, you know, make sure you've, you're citing sources on this data. Also, okay, had a conversation yesterday with a CEO and his wife joined us for dinner last night. And she's lovely. She's a teacher. And she asked the free version of an AI to develop a math quiz for her students. Okay, fantastic. But she didn't check it before she gave it to her students. And so her students were a little bit surprised when out of 10 questions, seven questions made sense and actually gave them the option for the right answer. But the other three were completely wrong, like not even close to being wrong. And I said, so what did you learn from this? And she said, well, as a teacher, I should know better than to give my students a quiz that I haven't checked. Okay, yes, that's good. And that's a good lesson for everybody in business. You don't just blindly accept what anybody gives you, not online, not in a report, not from a competitor. Why would you believe this, number one? And then number two, I asked her, I said, please tell me you were using the free version because it's not as good. And she goes, well, of course it's the free version. I'm not gonna pay for that. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everything else in your world that you value, you pay for. You pay for food, you pay for rent, you pay for your car, you pay for a lot of things that you value. You, you pay for cable TV, you pay $250 a month for cable, and you don't want to pay 20 bucks a month to use a tool that could make your life easy and give you back 10 hours a week. Okay, see, I struggle with this, Ford. I struggle with this. What do you tell people? Well, it's, it's so true. And the challenge people have right now is the basic understanding so, you know, there's three large language models in the, in the planet. There's, there's ChatGPT, which is Microsoft, and Microsoft now has Copilot, which is allowing you to interact with all the Microsoft programs. It's integrated, and it's supposed to keep your data private. So you can set it to private mode so that the information you're using is not being used in the large language model. So that's Microsoft. Then you've got Google, which used to have BARD, which doesn't exist anymore, and now it's Gemini. And Gemini is going to be integrated into all the Google suites. So you, whatever camp you're in, you can use one of those two. And then, of course, there's Anthropic, which is a third company of a large language model. Now, what we're saying here, we don't want to get technical, but we want you to know that those are the engines that drive thousands of other websites. So there's all these specific websites that have special modalities based on the industry and the outcome. And then there's a whole bunch of custom GPTs. Now, if you don't know what the hell I'm talking about right now, 
go to that, go to my website forward slash AI dash training. But let's get back to some of the things I want to talk about with you with the leadership part is the critical thinking part, right? And so, you know, I always tell people in my presentations that to bridge the gap from where they are to where they want to go in business, whether they're trying to increase sales, improve efficiency, improve their culture, their leadership, their team building, their management, communication change, doesn't matter what the topic is, comes down to three things. Mindset, because without the proper mindset, all the strategies in the world won't help. So they got to get their mindset mm -hmm. dialed in. And for some of you listening, that's what you need to work on. Maybe it's your mindset. Maybe you're closed-minded. Maybe you have a belief that isn't serving you. Number two, you got strategies. Well, that's why I'm interviewing Mary Kelly. Um, for, and if you want to go to her website, you can check her out at ProductiveLeaders.com. Great domain, right? If you want to be a productive leader, go to ProductiveLeaders.com and check out Mary Kelly. And, and you can see what she does. So that's your strategy. And then the third thing is your tactics. Well, tactics are how you get that done. And so on, on, this, on this show, what I like to do is have other experts on like you that can share insights for the listeners on how to think differently. And, and we don't always have to agree. People don't have to agree. If you, if you like what we're saying now, put some comments in the comments. We'd love to have comments. And of course, whatever platform you're watching, please like, share, hit the buttons, whatever. But a shameless plug there. But Mary, you know, when it comes to strategy, what do you do with leaders that have closed minded thinking or what they say is just plain wrong? Like they'll say, well, we we know what's going on with our employees. That's not why we have turnover. Uh, we need team building. And then you come in as a leader and you realize, no, it's not the team. It's the leadership. Like, what do you do when the when the C-level C-suite is might be delusional? And it happens more often than we'd all like to admit, let's face it. Many of our leaders got there because they're very, very good at very specific things. Right. And all of a sudden they get into a certain role and they might be good at 70% of it, but they don't know what to do with the other 30%. And as you know, Ford, I love assessments. I have a leader's blind spot assessment. And if you Google Mary Kelly, leader's blind spot assessment, it pops right up and anybody can take it and it's totally free. Yeah. Leader's blind spot assessment. Yeah. We love free stuff. And then I have other assessments that will help leaders see where the deficiencies are. So I do have an assessment for AI. How well are, is your organization? Not you, I'm gentle about that, but your organization. And then it's a basis for conversation. So there's one for businesses, there's one for government agencies, local, state, federal, because people need a snapshot in time of where they are. We all do. And I gotta tell you, Ford, I took my own leader's blind spot assessment and I was having a super good day and I was, I was making things happen. And all of a sudden I looked at my assessment. I was like, oh yeah, I could be, I could be missing a few things here. And it's my assessment. So I like holding up a mirror to our leaders. And sometimes our leaders need facts because they're, they're believing their own bias sometimes, just oh, like, yes. just like our search engines. Sometimes we like to drink our own Kool-Aid. And sometimes that is why you need an outside perspective. So one of my groups very recently, one of the CEOs said, I'm having trouble finding, finding talent. I said, let me tell you something. I said, the talent's out there, but here's the dirty secret that nobody is talking about. In the United States, we have a very, very low unemployment rate right now. The natural rate of unemployment is above 4%. That's if everybody who has a job, wants a job and is working is 4%. Well, we're below that. All right, statistically, how does that work? What it means is there are a whole lot of people with second jobs and side hustles. And I asked him, I said, one of the reasons so many remote workers do not want to come back to the workplace is because they've got a second full-time job. And they're doing that because inflation went up, the cost of everything has gone up by 32% on average for the things people care about from January, 2020 till October of 2023. Three, it's gone up by 32%, food, fuel, rent, transportation across the board. I can give you statistics on almost anything you wanna know, but that's the average for the average American family. Meanwhile, their income only went up for the household by an average of 4.1%. So this is a big delta. They understand they have to make up for that delta. There's two ways to do it. You can quit all your jobs and decide to live off the government, or you can get side hustles or a second job. Now, here's what surprised my CEO. He said, well, not that many people do this. Mm -hmm. I said, would you be surprised to know that it actually went up 
last year to 37% of remote workers have another full-time job. And that is why you cannot get them on a Zoom call. That is why they're not available for early morning meetings. You thought it was because, you know, they had kids or they were sleeping in or something happened. No, it's because they've got other meetings and they're trying to juggle it all. Now, if you know they've got another second full-time job and they're great, they can manage it. Like, let's say, you know, they're, they're hard chargers and they want to do it all and they can do it. I know a lot of people who can't, but what if they can't? And what if your managers aren't holding them accountable? And what if you're not getting the productivity out of them? And what if, what if, what if? And he was stunned by these numbers. He said, well, surely that's not my people. I said, well, statistics would indicate that at least a percentage of them are your people. Then the question is, what do you do about it? What the answer on that is you as a leader and a manager have to go to your folks and say, are our people producing what we want them to produce. Are they optimized at work? And if not, why not? Some of you, some of you all know listening, you know that some of your best workers, if they only work four hours a day, you're still getting more out of them than you are with everybody else. And if you're willing to pay them what you continue to pay them and you are satisfied with the work, what's wrong with that? I used to say, Ford, when I was in the Navy, you know, we we're in the Navy and, and sometimes people go, can you get this done by next week? And I'm like, I can get that done in 30 minutes. And they're like, no, no, don't take that long. You'll make the rest of us look bad. I'm like, oh boy, you know, there, there was that. You didn't want to, you didn't want to be too good or that was right, going to be a right. problem. But, you know, you and I work at Ford and Mary Speed. So that could be a little bit faster than other people on certain things. On other things, maybe not so much. So you as a leader have to really look at every single employee and figure out, is that person optimized at work? Are they in the right job? Are they doing the right work? For some people, they looked at people sitting around for a couple of years and said, you know what? I don't even know what that person does and we're not gonna miss them when they leave. And that made that decision. Well, you know, it's so true. I, I think that, you know, with two things, one back to the assessment part, you know, I've been using assessments forever way before I've had 17 different companies. I started in you know, my first assessment. I think I took was by the disc profile. And then I became certified for disc. And when I first got into speaking in, in the early nineties, I was a disc trainer. I was going out talking about how to use disc and dominant, influential, steady, and conscientious. Now I still use it decades later, but more in a marketing perspective from an intent. How are you communicating? Is your message aligned with the proper marketplace? But assessments are a great tool. My assessment actually says, Ford believes in win-win situations, but if he can't get win-win, he's okay with win-lose. And I thought, well, that's a really interesting dynamic there. I don't know if I should be proud of that or 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 what. But what I what I would say is assessments are a great tool, but they are just a tool. And for those of you listening, assessments are snapshots. They're not tests. They're not pass-fail. They're a tool to help you evaluate. And for those of you listening, this is for educational and informational purposes only. We are not giving you legal advice. So there we've got the disclaimer out of the way. So one assessment, you should do it. I like the culture index. I can't wait to go take your, your two assessments that you've got online, the surveys, because you know, the numbers don't lie at the end of the day, you know, most people are delusional about how long it takes to get things done and how much they're getting done. Right. I know that happens to me. That's the reason I'm saying it because it happens to me now. So that's the assessment part back to the second job part or the, or the second gig. You know, when I, when I, when everybody had to close down and we went through that pandemic. When I came back, I had two employees that really resisted at the first couple of weeks they were back. You know, they had to come into the office at eight 30. They had to be there till five and they were really struggling. And then they came at different times to me and said, Hey, you know, I really enjoyed this remote work. Can I work remote three days a week or four days a week? Can I just come into the office half day? And I kept on thinking, well, no, you have to be in here full time. And they're like, well, that's not going to work for me. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to free you up for new opportunities. Thanks for being here. And what I found out was they were working two full-time jobs, but they weren't doing the production. And I think the key takeaway is I'm not against someone making a second job because of inflation. They want to earn more money, but I'm against for them taking a second job, giving me half the production and then getting paid two full-time wages. And they're not really producing. So that was an issue for me. So I think the real takeaway from what you just shared is are, you know, do you have decent metrics in place? I like to use MTNO minimum target and optimal. So I have some type of measurement and then I want to be able to know, am I holding them accountable? Well, in business, people are good at one of three things, delivering the product or service, marketing or sales or leadership. Well, I've always been the marketing salesperson. That's why I love talking to you. 
because you're always like Ford, 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 my child, sit down. Let me, let me, let me, let me help you. And then you like lay out the land to me. And I'm like, oh, I didn't see because a lot of leaders come from, like you said, they're different strengths and they're not necessarily looking through the lens of productive and optimized leaders. And that's why for those of you listening, if you have an organization and you want to improve the performance of that team, I uh, highly recommend you check out Mary Kelly. This isn't a shameless plug. Literally, I've known her for decades. She's one of the people, when I think of leadership, I think of Mary Kelly. So the assessments are good. The double jobs are good. What, where can leaders go? Or what, what do you, what other challenges do you see before we go to where they can go? What so other you, challenges you do you see exactly when working? Good. Yeah, you touched on it. It's mindset. And that's where the assessments are really helpful. It's, am I focused on the right things at the right time? Am I getting up every single day prepared to reinvigorate my people with a sense of purpose, being positive every day, assessing the volatility, seeing the opportunities, and making sure we've got the tools, training, and tactics we need to be successful? That's the mindset. Then it becomes the strategy. All right, my team is equipped to do what they need to do. What do I need to do as the manager, as the leader, as the whatever to keep doing the good things that we're doing. What is my overall strategy? What is my vision? My vision is where we're going. It's not just what we do. We don't make garlic presses. That's our, that's our mission. We make garlic presses, but our vision is we make the world's premier garlic presses. We make garlic presses Italian kitchens want to have. We make garlic presses that everybody talks about. So the vision is where leaders need to spend a little bit of time, and that's part of their strategy. And then the other part of the strategy, of course, is figuring out what you're going to do, what's most important. You can't do everything, so you have to do what's most important, figuring out the priorities of where you're going to expend your resources. And that's your people, time, money, inventories, all of your stuff. And then you get your teams together and figure out the tactics. And you and I have both been told, and we know this, you can tell people what to do or you can tell them how to do it, but you probably shouldn't tell them both. So then once you get the strategy clear, then you get your team together and say, okay, what is the best way for us to get here? You know, that I love the Apollo 13 for that. They said, here's our problem. Here's the stuff we got to work with. Now, what are we going to do? You know, I love that example because when you get the group together and give them a problem that is tactical, a lot of my leaders spend a lot of time thinking about tactics, the how to instead of the what to do. And so for the tool I have for that is my 12 month business success and accountability planner. It's on the website, it's free. And it maps out for you as a leader this month, what are your top five goals? Not 30, five, what are your top five goals? And then it says, do your teams know what your top five goals are? Because wouldn't it be great if not only we, but our teams were aligned with what's most important in our organization? And then what if you knew what their top five goals were for the month so that you also knew how to support them as well? And then it asks you some other questions that are tactical. What do you want to do more of? What do you want to do less of? What should you be streamlining? How do you make it easy for people to do business with you? Easy for people. I love for Ford, you are always the easiest person on the planet to do business with. They now came out and said we can end uh, sentences with prepositions. I like that, by the way. You are the easiest person to do business with ever, not ending in a preposition. Because you're like, okay, let me, let's, this is what I can do to help you. Let's do this. Right. You know, you're all about let's get it done. Let's get it done fast. Let's go forward. Because that's what people need. People need people who can get things done. And when you find those people, you hang on to them. If they're a contractor, a consultant, an advisor, you hang on to those people who get things done and who help you get things done. And this is the part of the strategy where I think a lot of leaders and managers, frankly, struggle. If you're a manager and you don't know what to do, you kind of hate to go to your boss every time and go, um, I'm not really sure what to do here. I'm not really sure what to do here. I'm not really sure what to do here. Because you're thinking your boss is going to judge you I have, I have two dogs, as you know, and one of my dogs just looks at me with judgment all the time. So if I get up to, to go do something or make a snack, she's like, really? You're eating again? Like she's got that look in her eye. It's kind of that, say, that judgment that some of our managers are worried about their leaders having with them. And so leaders, we have to do a really good job of making sure our managers know what to do, but also know when to ask for help. Now, that's different from every single time somebody doesn't know a piece of software running to and asking you the questions. No, you've told them that 15 times. At some point, they need to look it up. 
But our managers sometimes don't feel, feel, and this is hard for right. me, feel like they they know what to do all the time. So they take two routes. Either they do nothing or they procrastinate, hoping that the problem magically goes away. And if you're a leader and your people are doing either of those things, you got to wonder, is it your fault or is it is the burden on them? to make things go forward. So this is where I see a lot of that breakdown between strategy and tactics. I do too. And it's, you know, I always like to say, hire for attitude, train for skills, you know, start at the top, make sure you have your leadership lined out because it's probably not management and team building. You got to get the leadership, the vision. I love when the concept of bringing the team together and then setting the target and then letting them have buy-in to help solve the problem because they're going to be more productive if they're part of the solution as opposed to being told what to do. And then of course, I do have a question. What is your thought on situational leadership? And so in my layman's perspective, for those of you listening, situational leadership as you know, some has been around for decades and it really means that instead of judging the person, you're judging the situation and you're asking yourself, just like you said, does this person have the skills, talents and abilities to do this and I can just delegate and they can just run with it or is it something where I really need oversight and handholding because they really don't even know how to do it? And that is very individual and very dependent and very situational, as you know. Because if you're going to hire for attitude, and I do love hiring for attitude, but I just brought a new hire in because, frankly, I needed some technical skills on my team with new things that I had a couple of folks who were okay, but I really wanted somebody to elevate the team. And so she has the right attitude, but she's also got these great technical skills. And so some of the things are, okay, I'm giving her, here's where we want to go. What, what do you think you can do to get us there? You know, what falls into your strengths that will help us get there? And then I'm having her lead that piece. That's and then great. some of the other team members, I said, okay, so if she does this, how do we support that? And then what are you going to do? Because we're all heading in the same direction. But as you know, we've got to approach it in different areas. We've got the HR, we've got the marketing, we've got the sales, we've got the follow-up, we've got the product development, we've got all of that. So how do we all get there together? And partly, people will sometimes identify their own strengths. But here's what I'm finding very interesting. A lot of our more junior workers, they don't know how good they are. And they don't know what they're good at. They've got a good attitude. Some of them have great training, great experience, and great natural ability, but they don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And this is where our managers are so, so critical. And right now, I got to tell you, Ford, and you probably know this, managers, especially in the United States right now, are burned out. They are tired. They are cranky. They are feeling squished on both sides. They're not sure if they're able to make decisions. They are. They're, they're a little sad. So to all the managers out there, you know, I want to give you a virtual hug for my puppy and uh, tell you you're doing okay. But also, it's time to take a good hard look at you and making sure you're not getting burned out. And burned out is not how much you're working or where you're working or that it is it's an emotional reaction to something you're not nuts about. Because you can be excited about a project, work 16 hours a day, feel energized every single second, and you're great. You can go for days. That's not burnout. Burnout is waking up in the morning with a sick feeling in your stomach and saying, oh, I'm just, I just don't know how I'm going to get through another day. That's burnout. So what's causing it? Is it you? Is it the workplace? Is it the situation? Are your people not doing their job? Is your leader not giving you what you need? Or are you simply in the wrong place? And sometimes that happens too. Yeah, I know I've seen situations where, you know, I, I try to fix it or F it. You know, I'm either gonna I'm either gonna fix it or okay, I'm done. We just need to move on, right? And and I'm not always right in that. And those of you listening or previous employees, you get that. But I think that a lot of times managers create codependent relationships because they, 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 they're empathetic, they care about their people. And so they really want to be their best friend and they don't really want to upset the apple cart. And so they solve all the problems and they want to be, they want to be measured based on how well they can help. And so they, they can create unknowingly a codependent relation where they end up taking on more than if they just was to hold the employee accountable. Your thoughts around that? Oh, Ford, I, there are so many places in business that are just like personal romantic relationships. You know, a lot of times people will say, oh, Ford, I really want to work with you. I'll call you. And you go, okay, 
they like me. They're going to call me kind of like you just met them at a bar and they're going to call you. They're never going to call you. And it's not because they don't like you. It's because they get home and they get caught up doing other things and then they lose your card and all that, you know, but we sometimes think we sometimes view doing business as though it was a personal romantic relationship. And sometimes we do that codependent thing as well. Oh, I really want to help this new person. They're, you know, they're just out of out of high school, they're just out of college, they're just out of whatever. You know, I really want to take them under my wing. I see them as the the future Ford sakes of the world right. or whatever it is. And 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 we get emotionally involved invested in a way that is maybe not allowing them to fully develop, but is maybe causing us to be a little bit unfair to some of the other employees as well. So we have to kind of guard against all the emotions that go into the job. Now, I'm not saying you can't be friends with people at work. You can't, but it's a business. And you go to work because it's work. If it was a hobby, then we'd all just say kumbaya, love each other. Nobody would get paid. And, you know, it would just be a lovely, lovely nirvana. But for most of us, business is business and work is work. And we go to work because yes, it does fuel our soul. Yes, it does fill our buckets of accomplishment, but it also pays us. And if your people are not performing, then your business is not going to be profitable, which means you can't pay them as well as you probably could if you were running a really good business. And I'm not saying that money trumps everything, but for most people, they need the income. They want the benefits. They're looking for a job that will help them support their families so that they can be good members of communities and have them live a really good life. So you've got to run a great business, a profitable business, so that your people have great incomes and can be great people. It's not, it's not something that operates in a vacuum. And this is why sometimes my leaders say, well, I'm just not sure what to do. And I go, then wake up in the morning and think about how you're going to run a good business. What are you going to do today to run your business even better than you did yesterday? What are you going to do today that makes you money for the future? And some people go, oh, that sounds so mercenary. No, it's, it's critical thinking. I think it's, it's really, it's critical thought. And so for those of you that have stuck with this, uh, we're, we're live right now on multiple platforms. So please put some comments below. If you like it, connect with us on LinkedIn and, and let us know what your top challenges are that you're facing. And so here's a question for you. Since those of you that made it this far, either into the podcast or the broadcast, what do we do? And I'm going to be political here. It's at the end of the episode. So what about the culture of, I'm going to say woke and snowflake, but I know it's going to offend some people. So just for the purposes of that, let me explain what I'm saying. People that are a little less, they're, they're thin skinned. So when I say snowflake, I'm not, I'm not trying to insult anybody. I'm just saying, you get them and they think that they can be on Facebook half the day or that they can they can have a different monitor with YouTube videos playing or that they can listen to sports radio while they're supposed to work. And and I'm talking about talk radio. I'm not talking about music in the background. And, and what do you do? Because there are a lot of uh, entitlement where they come in and they're entitled and they just have this belief that, well, I'm working hard and you should, you know, do more for me. And there's these videos that have gone viral on YouTube, I won't reference the particular one, but a lot of them have gone viral where a lady worked for for three months as a salesperson, got fired, went on social media, bashed the company because she said, well, I worked really hard and so they shouldn't have fired me. But at the end of the day, she didn't sell anything for 90 days. So the concept of entitlement or just, they're not intrinsically motivated. And, and I realized that it's the organization's role to find the right people, to give them the right motivation and match the job. So let's assume that th- that they they've done, done done the right thing that they found a candidate that should be able to do the job, but maybe they're just not handling it very well. <laughs> it's a lot to unpack, but tell me what you think. So these are the E's. Employee engagement is driven by more E's. It is driven by the expectations you have, you set, and you maintain. That's accountability, but it's expectations. From day one, you have to say, "This is what we do here." When I was coaching Little League, and I, as you know, I don't I'm have taking kids, notes. But I so I'm going to put you full screen, but I'm taking notes. Okay. Okay. As you know, I coached Little League for about 10 years, and I don't have my own children, but I really like children. And so when I coached Little League, I would tell the parents, there's certain things that we don't do. There's certain things that we do, because that's setting the expectations and making it clear. 
And some of those expectations are things like, you don't get to badmouth another kid. You don't get to say anything bad to somebody else's kid. I don't want any other parents saying that about your kid. We just don't tolerate that. And I would tell parents and they go, well, but I go, no, we're better than that. See, that's setting the expectations. And nobody can argue that. That's what's so great. Nobody can argue with, we're better than that. Setting the expectations. Then number two is the, the other E here is the examples. You got to model the behavior. So I had to make sure on my little league team that I was modeling the behavior I wanted from my parents. So let's say the umpire makes a bad call. Keep in mind, the umpire in little league is a 14 year old kid who was probably on my little league team a few years ago. So I made, you know, and you want to say, can't you see that? Are you blind? Right. You know, you want to have that parental reaction, but what, you don't do that. What you do is go, okay, next play, let's go. You know, you, you model the behavior you want, you set the example. And then the third E is you, lead by experience. And what I mean by that is when someone comes into your organization and they see everybody else, all of a sudden, you know, they come in at 820, they grab coffee and they're working at 830. They go, oh, this is what we do here. They will pattern after other people. They take other people's experiences and they learn from this. The same way is for all of you dog people out there, if you've ever had one dog, if you've ever had dogs, you only have to train one. And then you just got to get other dogs while that dog is still alive because the, the puppy will model the behavior of the older dog. They will go after that experience of that other dog. And the older dog will simply by experience teach the, the other dog. So set the expectations, model the behavior, and then lead by experience. And that drives employee engagement. Well, I think on that, that that's a great way to wrap it up. I'm going to do a quick little ending. Stick around in the green room. So we go live. Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Central. Thanks for being here today, everybody. Thank you for tuning into Fortify Live. Make sure to like, comment, and share this episode on your favorite social media platform. And don't forget to subscribe to the Business Growth Show podcast, available wherever you get your podcast streaming fix. We air weekly at 11 a.m. Central time. So until next week, 